Put on your seatbelt. Let's go. All right. Turn up the music. Trip podcast. <laughs> oh, happy summer. That was a good <laughs> summer scream. I think so. The acoustics were quite different since we are in a different ride. Yeah, we're in a different ride on a different coast. We're heading up Interstate 81. We're in Tennessee right now, so we're not quite to the coast yet. But we're making our way to Georgetown, D.C. D.C., yes. For episode 90. And we are in a new ride. Yes. Uh, were we in it last time? No. No, I don't think no. so. This is our first episode, maybe. You guys In Baby Gail? Yeah, Gail. No, Gail went to Fright... No, no, Gail didn't go to Fright You're right. Okay. All right. Anyways. New sound um, booth, new ride. New sound booth, yes. I think that's... I think that's right, or maybe wrong. Who Correct knows? Correct us if you know. Yeah. <laughs> Is this the first time that we're in Gale, the new the new sound booth? Because we don't remember anymore. Um, but we're on our way because we're going to Georgetown to cover The Exorcist 3. The Dutrois. We haven't covered uh, Duh. <laughs> yeah, yet. we haven't covered part two, but... We didn't need to. We're just skipping right over it, going to Exorcist 3, directed by William Peter Blatty, written by William Peter ba- Blatty. It's all about the WPB, baby! <laughs> uh, based off his novel, Legion. Yes. Um, this is Blatty to the max. Blatty times three. The, you know, it's the book Legion, and then he adapted it to a screenplay. So here we have it, and then he directed it. <laughs> He's three times the oh, Blatty. That's three Blats. <laughs> One for me, one for you, one for someone else. One for y'all, listener. Yeah. Here you go. You got a bladdy, I got a bladdy. We all you got, got a bladdy. We're getting bladdied all day. Okay, let's move on from being bladdied. But let's talk about who's in it and why we're like, what we're like, so yeah, we're going to go see some sites. We've got a lot of filming locations yeah, to we're visit. Just, yeah, we're going to just like roam around Georgetown all day, eat some Food. There's lots of cute shops and cafes and restaurants. Might cool. visit a confessional. Yeah, there's the water side to walk around. There's also, of course, we'll go back to the steps, which we visited way back when we covered Exorcist 1. You can go back and find that episode. I believe it was like maybe episode 28. Yeah, it was long ago, long ago. Back like in yesteryears. 2018 or 2017 maybe? Yeah. Long time. Long time. But yes, we visited the, the steps, the infamous steps for The Exorcist, and so we'll walk those steps one more time, yeah. visit them, but we wait. do, yeah, we have like a lot more to do while we're walking around Georgetown than previous. Yeah, we're going to spend the whole day there, as opposed to last time, we just kind of drove into Prospect Street, saw the house, the steps, and then... We ended up going to like Arlington Cemetery. Yeah, we did some DC stuff. stuff but, but we're gonna spend the day in Georgetown, explore the the hood, the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. We've been looking up little restaurants and bakery delis to go to, coffee shops, so we could be all up in it. Yeah, we're going to uh, what is it, a college town in the summertime? Yes, we're going to a college town in the summertime. <laughs> And so it will but still be really full because it's summertime, so everyone's visiting D.C. right yeah, now. So exactly. it's going to be packed, um, and we're excited about it. Love coming to Virginia. We're going to be visiting areas of Virginia as well, and then um, traversing for another episode up in Pennsylvania. Yeah, episode 91. We'll tell you about that at the end. At the end, but we're at the beginning of episode 90. <laughs> With 
George C. Scott, we're going to name some of the actors. Yes, and Ed Flanders. They, uh, Ed Flanders had previously had worked on The Ninth Configuration, which is another blatty uh, <laughs> double up, direct and right uh, little thing. Uh, Brad Dourif, he's playing the Gemini Killer and slash Legion. That's one of the good things about this movie. The actors are really going for it. And the it's like. Uh, Theatrical display. They are chewing up the scenery, but in the best way possible. The pile is <laughs> not there! <laughs> yeah, like, Jeez. these people are yelling. The nurses are constantly the yelling nurses. and angry. Oh my gosh. George C. Scott is pissed off or crying a lot. He's an emotional gambit. He is. It's, he's, he's a showboat. I love, I love every bit of him being on, on the screen. Yeah, because he, he just delivers the lines with so much feel behind them. Oh, he is committed 100% to this role. We even have Jason Miller who pops in. Now there's like, that is kind of where the movie um, and where a lot of the drama behind the scenes like came from. There's kind of like obvious, you can see it in the movie where like there's been added scenes like additionally mm-hmm. and where they had to redo the producers in the studio were like um you guys there's not actual exorcism in this and even though the book's called legion we want to call it exorcist three legion vladdy was like no i don't want it to be three because i don't like two yeah and he wanted it to be called legion and you know be a direct like sequel, sequel but not directly from two um and of course, like the money wins out, so the producers <laughs> win, so it gets you yeah. know it's gonna be called The Exorcist Three, and they also wanted Jason Miller like badly, but Jason Miller was an alcoholic and was at that point like not capable, able to memorize those long monologues that Blatty had for yeah, they patient, were... you know, X slash Legion. And a commentary we we're listening to that. Like, they call the, I guess there's a term for it called wet brain. Yeah, yeah. His brain was just so muddied up from years and years and years of alcoholism and so he admitted like he's not going to be able to memorize yeah. these lines so they kind of like thought, okay, we'll get Brad Dourif <laughs> to be like the demon inside him yeah, talking. To, yes, and, we'll actually and he'll see pop him. through <laughs> Yeah, and we'll see him and he's the Gemini killer yes. and so that ends up what's hap- what happens in the film um, and so you're kind of like going along for the ride with Kinderman believing that it's supposed to be Father Karras but we'll get into yeah, all of that there's... when we get into the movie and that might be where a lot of it falls apart or... yeah I mean there's certainly a lot of things to admire about this movie like we were saying the performances there is a really cool creepy procedural movie in there and, yeah, yeah. And it's a cop drama. With really creepy imagery and, you know, Catholic yes. imagery that's, you know, turned on its head and made scary. If, as Literally if it was, turned on its head. As if it wasn't already, but, um, yeah, so there's things I like about this movie. It has one of the best jump scares of all time, mm-hmm. uh, which we'll talk about later, but, yeah, so I guess we just... We'll just kind of dive into yeah. it and... Um, dive into the host body? Dive into the host body. <laughs> well, I guess, like, you know, the opening of it is... A, you can see where they go back and they throw in the theme, you know, the exorcist theme for, like, five seconds. We get that just for a moment, just a little kiss at the opening. We get the music just to remind us this is an exorcist movie. But then... Um, and we're seeing Georgetown at night. Yeah, we, we see, you know, them rowing at sunset. We see Lieutenant Kinderman and Father Dyer. And we're just seeing them kind of being melancholy. Yeah. Uh, both at, like, their respective job slash, like, you know, Kinderman's working over his desk and Dyer's doing a little bit of uh, the Eucharist. He's saying Mass. But... We'll see them again, but the opening is Georgetown. Mm -hmm. And we find out the reason they are sad and looking very contemplative is because it's apparently the 15th anniversary of Father Karras falling down the steps and dying. 
Yes, so it's the 15th anniversary of that, and sadly, in the earliest parts of the morning, there is a body found by the docks by where you know, we had just seen the rowers when there was sunset, and it is sadly the body of a 12-year-old, and we've seen this 12-year-old in the opening. In the dream. In you this dream, dream sequence, him. and we get these in this movie, but the opening is Georgetown, but in this like dream-like way. Yeah, and, Kinderman, we find out, is like almost, not psychic, but he does kind of dream and predict things um, yeah, throughout yeah. the movie so there is some kind of weird psychic connection there with like the victims yeah because he kind of dreams about it before he even finds out about them got some kind of or we might even throw in that legion is peppering Me, yeah, in true, images of these victims um, into his because he's playing with them because we will find out he's that legion wants him. revenge on some of these people. Okay, but yeah, so we get this dream sequence, like, you know, dance around Georgetown, and, and it ends with Kinderman waking up, and there's um, a there's a body that's been found. He's going down there. It's sad because there's, like, we see the mother crying. The and pop comforting her. Yeah, and, and you can see also in the background, like, that it's Georgetown. There's the churches. It's so just intricately weaved into the little culture there. All of the, you know, the fathers running around in their little uh, black and white, yeah. you know, robed outfits. And, and they really try to make a point that Georgetown is a very Catholic community and that anything that's not Catholic is kind of looked down upon. They say some straight up kind of racist things, but, or not racist. Yeah, well, racist. Kinderman calls out, out some racist. racism. Yeah. There's some like weird comments and things throughout the movie. You can tell that they're really trying to be like, see, this town is very Catholic. Yes. Anything else is like strange or weird to them. And Kinderman, in us meeting Kinderman and getting this idea of what he's been up to for the last 15 years, he's kind of reprimanding his team for s some racist things that they were saying about Jewish people or Italian people mm -hmm. that were, you know, in the neighborhood. And, um, but he's also immediately, like, from pretty much from the get-go, Kinderman is playing with this idea of the Gemini killer. Like, the moment the murders happen, yeah, he's, he's like, already hmm. like, Gemini killer? Like This is very reminiscent of the Gemini killer. Yeah. And so he's, like, the hearing, a, hearing about the murder that's happened, he knows the victim. The victim is a young boy who participated in kind of this, like, you know, uh, aware, police awareness on the streets, like trying to be friendly with cops and uh -huh. like the buddy, you know, police system where, but he knew him. So Community he was really outreach, sad. So. Like he was visibly sad, torn up, and he was going to see Father Dyer in a little bit because they... Comfort each other on this day every year because they were both friends with... Father Karras. And so he is like visibly sad. He shows up to meet Father Dyer and they meet at the, the cinema. They yeah, go to see yeah. It's a Wonderful Life. That's right. But don't they go out to eat first and chit chat for They'll a while? They'll do that after oh, the movie. Oh, they do that after yeah. the movie. Okay. Uh -huh. So they go to the movie and he's like, I'm sorry I'm late. Um, you know, how's everything? And they had just told kind of like their respective peers like oh I've got to go meet so and so because yeah, I've got to be their emotional crutch for yeah, the day. and they both say that about each other so it's like huh huh so you show up they go see It's a Wonderful <laughs> Life and that's um, Dyer's favorite movie yes and that's what he wants to see on the day that he remembers his friend's passing Father Karras and like, even though it's a Christmas movie whatever yeah, it's just whatever it's it's for him, Josh. It's not for you. That's this true. This isn't about this you. This isn't about me. I wouldn't watch it that time of year. But no. He can watch it whenever he wants. He can he watch pleases. it whenever he wants. It's fine. And 
they're about to leave and Kinderman's like, you know, I really don't want to go home. I've got this fish swimming around in my bathtub. Yeah, it's the um, most bizarre, like, it's fish just a in the funny tub story. story. Yeah. He's like, I haven't showered in days. There's a fish swimming and I hate this fish. Um, his mother-in-law thinks that, like, buying dead fish has impurities, so she buys them alive and then they swim around for a few days in, like, clean water and then she kills them. Yeah. Something like that. Some story like that. I'm like, why don't you just buy it the day you're going to eat it? And then Josh. And have to swim around for a few days. That's their, st- this their story. Bathtub. Yeah. That's their story. The fish shit all in your tub. Fish shit? Ew. I didn't even think about that. And is she starving it? Is she feeding it? Like. Yeah, who knows? I don't know. <laughs> it sounds, it sounds sus, sus and shady, but Okay. Um, so they go and they're like eating at like a little pub and Kinderman is all about this idea that like there can't be a God because if there is a God and he's okay with like all this suffering, then he's not cool, which that's like a heavy philosophical, like it's very existential. Yeah. (laughs) I thought we were coming to have a beer. And so Dyer's like, are you sad because of that boy? Like the the little boy that died, uh-huh. and so he's like, "Yeah, I'm sad about that little boy who died. Like, why does this stuff have to happen?" And then Dyer tells him, "Like, well, it all washes out in the end." Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which to me, I'm like, "Okay, I don't know if I can get by that philosophy either." <laughs> like, I mean, bad things happen, and they just happen, and then it it all it all washes out It'll in all the be end. Too. Yeah, like. We're all spirits. We never... Re- he says something to him about, like, at the end of we the day, really we're die. all... Yeah, yeah, spirits, we never really die. So, I guess that's what Father Dyer clings to. And as they're having this little chat, another murder is take- is taking place. And it's um, at... Another priest. Uh-huh. It's at a local church. And there is this old lady who goes into the confessional, and she's like, Father. Yeah, Father. You know, it's funny. It's actually the voice of Colleen Dewhurst. She's an Academy Award-nominated actress who was married to George C. Scott, I think, at the time. Or they were already divorced. I can't remember. However, she... You guys might know her as uh, Marilla from Anna Green Gables, the series from the 80s. That's her. Oh, wow. Okay, super <laughs> deep, deep, deep cut. There you go. Wow, we... That's the knowledge I brought to you this brought, episode. You did bring a little bit of knowledge, as they say in France. <laughs> Don't they say that? Sorry, I was taking a drink. I got a little... I need a little uh, little water, a little libation. She had a wet her whistle. I had to wet my whistle. <laughs> gross. That sounds so gross. Okay, so there's a murder taking place in a confessional. An old lady is going to butcher a priest inside the confessional, guys. There's going to be blood splattered all over this motherfucker. But we don't see it. We don't see it. The build-up is creepy AF, as the kids say. Um, the tension and the build-up, her voice gets like just more, and the things she's saying get more sinister. Talking about, like, it's all the blood, all the, I cut their necks and watch them bleed out. I watch out. them bobbing. Ugh. Yeah. And the... Priest is getting visibly shaken, and then it just cuts to like a woman screaming, who you know has found the body, and the cops are there. Sadly, there's just not really much payoff on that. Yeah, but it is I the build up. It's really creepy. Yeah, and so the cops are now there, obviously, because that's what cops do. They've got to take over because now it's a crime scene, <laughs> and Kinderman is he's looking at like. The body, he's examining the hands, he's looking to see that there's like a finger missing. Yeah. There he looked at the other hand. We don't know why. Like that's the thing. We're just watching him circle around like a carrying crow and like pick at his he's limbs. He's studying, he's working, he's thinking of every angle. Yeah, but we don't know exactly what he's gathering yet, but he's making note of some things. And then a police officer comes up, like another detective, and he's telling him, hey, guess what? We just found out that uh, the kind of like the blood samples came back, uh, drug tests positive for a paralysis drug. So like the little boy was 
given a paralysis and it slowed down his breathing but he was like tortured and like cut up and like had like things poked in his eyeballs and stuff before he died and then then they cut his head off Uh, i'm just like okay worst case scenario thanks for playing and play by play you know i just could have probably you could have just stopped at like hey guess what that drug caused paralysis he was alive still i'd have made sense of everything else (laughs) they really they wanted the top not only being a kid killer movie but like really going for the gut like we butchered this kid yeah and um so now like I, you know, Kenderman's registering that too. Like, okay, so they had to have some kind of like medical training. Yeah. If they, you know, everything they, was just so precise. And and they have to have access to this kind of drug. So they have to be like at a hospital, and they've got to be at like this. There's only I guess one hospital because everything just takes place at this like psychiatric hospital. Even if you just like hurt your hand, you're yeah, there. It's an all around hospital. But. <laughs> There's just kind of like crazy people just wandering around everywhere because it's a, um, it's a psychiatric it's a facility yeah. for them. Um, so we get another um, scene of Kinderman with all the police officers and they're talking about the fingerprints and that the fingerprints aren't matching. Like the fingerprints on some of the things that were found at the crime scene of the little boy don't match fingerprints that are um, here at the crime scene for the priest Priest. um, on the confessional door and so Kinderman's like wait there's multiple people killing like the Gemini killer because he immediately goes to Gemini killer yeah Um, again we don't really know his reasoning and we're still trying to figure out who exactly the Gemini killer is so Kinderman goes to sleep and has like um a, well, no, he goes to the psychiatric hospital because he's visiting Father Dyer. And yeah, we don't we know why don't f- he's there. And I, f- I watched and, like, re-watched this whole scene to be like, okay, what what actually happens? Like, why is he here? But Father Dyer has ended up at the single hospital that they have here in Georgetown, I guess. <laughs> and no one's nice like they like yell it that's how we Everybody find out that like the like nurses yelling. are yelling it's the strange. performances are really weird in these hospital sequences particularly and kinderman also visits this hospital because there's a doctor there named dr temple who has reached out to him about the connection between um people that like are associated with like the hospital that are dead that are the murder victims yeah and so Dyer's there and he's like okay well all right I'm gonna go gotta go get some sleep (laughs) and then he takes this dream sequence nap and and dreams about Fabio Fabio's there as an angel wearing wings and then we see the little boy that was murdered earlier and he walks up to uh Kinderman is like, and Kinderman's like, hey, Tommy, I'm sorry you were murdered. I really miss you. Yeah. And then he's like, I miss you too. And they His just, neck's like cut, like completely, like his head is stitched back on. Yeah. And they go on their way. It's like very surreal and odd. Even the performance is like that. Oh, I miss you. Sorry you were murdered. That feels very dreamlike. It's yes. just so bizarre. Cadence and everything and how they're talking is just like, okay, out of place. Like, this isn't real life um he sees like the other priest that had recently was killed in his dream and like his head was cut off but then sewed back on and then he sees father dyer in his dream and father dyer as well because he goes i wonder if you and i are having the same dream right now and father dyer goes oh i'm I'm not not dreaming." dreaming and he has his head all cut off and sewn up so we're kind of made to think like oh is Uh dyer dead and then he immediately wakes up and, you know, where he's rushing to the hospital, we find out Dyer is dead. Dyer so, dead. Dyer dead. Die, Dyer. Dyer dead. Dead, 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 Dyer. Dead, dead, Dyer, Dyer, dead, dead, Dyer, dead, dead, Dyer wakes up. <laughs> not only did he not wake up, Dyer's dead, um, but Kinderman gets to the hospital and they let him into um, Dyer's hospital room. And there are these 
this line, this tray. Okay, so there's like a tray, a specimen tray that's there, and on the specimen tray are all of these like specimen jars. Probably and at least what, them, like a dozen, maybe twenty. Probably close to double, like two dozen. Yeah. And they're filled perfectly with no smudge, no trickle down of all of Father <laughs> no Dyer's trickle. blood. Yeah. He his whole blood. What do they say? Supply all his the blood, blood in his supply. body essentially. Is in those jars immaculately sitting just next to him and his head has been removed there's no blood because it was like clean cut just removed and then in his blood is written on the wall it's a wonderful life, life and full with two L's yeah. so and that's them. another thing <laughs> that Kinderman takes note of Cause like we don't like it's about to come unwrap. We're about to find everything out in this like next scene. But until then, we've just been watching him make note on different things and then bring up the Gemini killer. But it's all gonna come together. Kinderman questions the nurse. I love this nurse, by the way. She's a bitch. She yeah. says she says it herself. She's like, I'm a bitch. And she's always talking like this. But what are you doing in here? She's the one, though, that is that finds Father Dyer deader than a doornail with no yeah. blood inside him. And she's supposed to have given him his medicine at, like, 6 o'clock, but yet she finds him completely uh, just drained she out. And she'd last seen him at 5. She's very hostile, though, from the beginning. They both have this weird rapport with each other where he's, like, very accusatory it's, and she's very, like, defensive. It's like a tennis match. It's strange. It's just crazy how, like, it's, like, a question is served and then, like, how it's answered. And it the level of, like, hostility just raises a bar every question that's asked. But he's wanting to find out, okay, so when did you go in the room? When did you leave the room? How long were you gone? What happened in between that? And she's like, well, in between... Five and six o'clock, I found one of the catatonic ladies that's usually in the psychiatric <laughs> ward just walking around. Yeah. And so I had to like get her back to her space. And she was passed out on the floor. Yeah, she yeah, she was oh yeah, she had been walking around, but she had passed out on the floor. So she was like tending to her when all of this took place. And then she gives the name of the lady, and Kinderman's like, all right, well, I'm going to go see her next. So he goes to see Miss Cull, uh, Clanahan or whatever. She's like, you here to fix my radio. My yeah. radio, fix it. You got to fix it. And he's like, sure, I'll fix your radio. And then she's like, you idiot, that's not even a radio. It's a telephone. But it's all imaginary. She doesn't have anything in her hands. She's <laughs> just making shit up. And... So we meet her, we can obviously see she's not all there, but Dr. Temple's like, oh wow, you caught her on a really good day. Usually she says nothing, like she's <laughs> not talking at all. So she's at least a bunch playing of weird your imagination stuff. with you. And um, Dr. Temple walks Kinderman around the facility, takes him through all of the like holding cells, the isola isolation chambers. And we walk right by this, like, ominous growling <clears throat> chamber that's got, we know, something terrible behind it. And there's just someone sitting there in the shadows in their straight jacket. <laughs> um, but Temple, it, it, like, really does seem like he is going out of his way to show that off. You know, like... And then over here we have our isolation area yeah. and but why would Kinderman need to see that if it's if that's like the place that's most monitored and secure? Maybe because Father Dyer was just in a regular all his hospital. Teeth room. Not in his eyes, maybe. Well no. I mean we find out <laughs> that's not the case, but um, we do hear Damien's voice kind of like come over and he's saying names like Kinderman and saying all the K names yeah. of everybody he's killed off like um so all the police officers and some doctors and like representatives of the hospital all meet in Dr. Temple's office with Kinderman and this is where Kinderman kind of like unveils like everything because the hospitals of one 
mind and the police are of another mind. They kind of want to like close the hospital down and start and a huge investigation. Kinderman's like, no, hear me out. It's the Gemini killer. And he's, I know died 15 years ago, but it's the Gemini killer. And I know we killed him in an electric chair, but it's him. He's come back. I can't explain that part. Trying to figure it out. That's why I'm touring this hospital. <laughs> but the M.O.'s match and it's not the MOs that were in the newspapers because what I'm about to tell you guys is those were fake. What we put in the newspaper about how the Gemini killer murdered people that was so we could weed out all of the the people calling in claiming that they did it when they clearly did it. But the way that these people are being killed is exactly in the way of the Gemini killer down to the fact that He'll only kill people with a K name in their name. And so now, every time a character is introduced, you're like, do they have a K name? And they do. And it's like so annoying. Like yeah. so many people will have a K name. Um, but Kinderman's like, so I'm still trying to figure out the connection between like Dyer and uh, Father uh, Kinnerman and the little boy. You know, I'm still trying to figure that all out. But it has to do with, like, the hospital. Like, you know, it's got to do with, like, that they all were here or... Mm -hmm. Somebody involved with the hospital. It's either a doctor, maybe. We'll find out it's So he, like, goes to the archdiocese to talk to Father Dyer's, like, superior. That's what a lot of this movie is. There's so much exposition. There's so much, like... You know, it's a procedural, so it's, like, scene by scene of, like... Just a lot of talk. A lot of learning and scaffolding, like building on like what this other scene before had just had. And then a lot of murder. Yeah. That too. The arch die I don't know, I because I really don't even remember getting his name, but he is a father as well. Everybody's like, you know, a priest, but he <laughs> was like the boss of Father Dyer. And he tells Kinnerman all the, like, things that he really needs to know. That, like, okay, Kinnerman was in charge of Father Karras during the time that Father Karras did his original exorcism on Reagan. And um, when Karras wanted to know about Reagan's ability to speak another language, in The Exorcist 1, she speaks backwards perfectly language. They're like, remember that scene, guys? That was really creepy. Remember? And somehow that's how the little boy's mother is connected to, um, is like she worked for the, like, people that researched the language. That's right. And that's a stretch, but okay, I get it. Like, this is like... (laughs) He had a beef to grind with her. (laughs) Yeah. He was just getting back at anybody who was connected connected in any way at all that he could get his hands on Uh and then we hear about father mourning um because karis or karis kinderman is like okay well without father karis like who's gonna do an exorcism if whoever it is that's doing these things is possibly possessed who could we have do an exorcism and then this guy's like Oh, well, have you heard Father Morning's back in town? (laughs) You can tell it's one of those scenes that was added later when they had to go back and do reshoots. And they're like, oh, we need someone to mention a... Gotta flesh this out. (laughs) Yeah, you're probably, you're exactly right. Because it's, this is like so much of like the lacking. And what's funny is like, there's still a director's cut. Like what we're talking about is the theatrical cut of this movie. There's a director's cut that even more, there's more exposition in it. Yeah. So. But I think it's supposed to have like a cleaner ending, you know, there's not the weird exorcism right the last 10 minutes. Yeah. And and yeah. And and it's like not all just completely put together, pieced together. Some of it's like kind of storyboarded, like, uh, just like still shots, Mm -hmm. I believe of like things. Um, they lost a lot of the footage. Uh, I think it's Universal, right? Yeah, it was lost of the direct a lot yeah. of this footage that he originally. The director's cut that directed. I had watched was from Scream Factory, so. Yeah, and a lot of had... it was like patched together, like probably uh, dailies or things like that, or like really old 
roughed up footage that they restored as well as they could, but you could tell it was different. Yeah, definitely not, you know, there weren't, it wasn't all, clean. yeah, clean movie put together, you know, with all the bells and whistles. Yeah. Um, so. You could tell it was salvaged. Yeah, th- but this scene wasn't, this is in the theatrical, and this is just, this this one priest piecing together everything that we kind of need, filling in the blanks, but telling us about Father Morning, whose hair turned white after an exorcism in the Philippines. <laughs> <laughs> like, wow. And, okay, so we hear about Father Morning, so we know there's a priest in town that could possibly give an exorcism if needed, because when this movie was first put together, it's Legion, and Blatty wasn't worried about their necessarily being an exorcism because it's a continuation of the story. It isn't like the see, you know, it's not like, no, we need yeah, a, a sequel of another exorcism. There's never going to be an exorcism scene in his original version and what they... And it wasn't supposed to be called The Exorcist 3. And so it, it, it does, it does like, there is a disconnect in like the ending of this movie as the theatrical and the intention of yeah. Like, the rest of the movie. It's just so off-kilter. And some of the special effects at the end and, like, the crazy exorcism scene are really cool. Like, really nasty, like, bodies being torn apart and stuff. But it it, it just feels out of place. Yeah, because it... And I'm not saying that, like, everything always has to make sense and we can't suspend belief and we can't, like, you know, just something can't be because it is. It's just this character comes out of nowhere after being mentioned once in the last, like, 10, 13 minutes yeah. of the movie. It's kind of, like, the weirdness of it. So we get this mention of Father Morning and I guess his capabilities that, like, he can exercise some demons in the Philippines and come back with gray <laughs> hair where Father Karras exercised a demon and died. I don't, you know, I don't yeah. really, I guess he was trying to say, like, this guy's got gumption. Like, he's, he's he got survived. some. He survived. Um, he came back with some gray hair. He's been through it. He's experienced. <laughs> and where we, I guess, if you felt like you were lacking in exposition, um, where maybe that was the case, cut to this next scene, and it's Dr. Temple, and he's walking around his office, and there's pictures of him and all of his accolades, all, you know, like the great things that he's done. And we can hear him, and he's obviously talking to himself, but he's, it's, he's rehearsing. And it's like yeah. he's got a script, and we see he's got no card in his hand, and he is rehearsing, telling what we know is about to, because he's saying, like, Kinderman, so we know he's, like, going to talk to Kinderman, and he's trying to rehearse that he's going to tell him that the person that is in the isolation chamber that he walked around and showed him to earlier that he is claiming, claiming to be the Gemini killer. Dun, dun, dun. So, knock, knock, knock. Kinderman's on his, you know, at his door and he's like, hey, come on in. So we hear, because he's now saying it a third time. And you kind of are <laughs> starting to see, like, wait a second, this guy's setting Kinderman up like he has some weird motives what's going on with this Dr. Temple guy why does he know about this why why did he not say it from the very beginning why is he dancing around all of it and when he first gets in it's you know he sees the actual person as Father Karras like an age you know 15 years older Father Karras and um, they start chatting and this is where it, we get like expedition, exposition, almost like a ten-minute monologue from. It's going to turn into Brad Dourif in a minute. There's like this edit where uh, Kara starts getting angry about something, and it flashes to uh, Brad Dourif, and he's saying what, like, "I am alive." It's this weird, like, facial transition, like from Kara to Brad Dourif's character, the Gemini, the killer. Gemini killer, and. I, I don't really know what else to say about it other than it's purple. Like, there's this backlight of purple that comes on their face, and that's the weird lighting transition that goes from it's Karis to it's Brad Dourif's character. It's an interesting way to get around, like, the problem they were having with Jeremy Miller, but, or... Yeah, but uh, Jason Miller. Jason yeah. Miller. <laughs> Jeremy uh, Miller's another actor, right? 
No, I think it's someone we might know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, uh, um, but, so, yeah, because this is where we, you know, Jason Miller, he's only peppered in because of the, he, he, the, his troubles. So, um, we get Dr. Temple telling us, like, yeah, we found Father Karras on the shores of the river, of the Cynic River. And, you know, but he's telling this to Kinderman and it's like, dude, I know that you think you buried your friend, but like we found this man who looked a lot like Father Karras uh-huh. on the Cynic. We didn't find any ID on him. He was so discombobulated. We classified him as catatonic and we put him in the isolation chamber. And he's now two weeks ago, kind of woken up from being out of his crazy mental state and all he's saying is that he's the Gemini killer and he's acting violent so we've had to put him completely away but I think he's your friend and then he goes in there and it's him it's his friend like that would be fucking crazy yeah. you thought you buried it 15, 15 years, years ago? ago but then there's he there is such like a disconnect with when he sees him because he almost knows right away something is off. Is off. But. It's like he, it's in his shell. Like it is a shell of Father Karras, but he doesn't talk like him. He doesn't have mannerisms like him. He, I mean, he immediately goes into his you know ten minute monologue of murdering people and like, how he butchered them. Daddy was and, mean to me, so I'm killing daddy over and over is basically what he's Yeah, saying, saying. and you're like, wait, what? Not, but, but then he's saying, I am in Father Karras' body. Because someone told me to come into it because it would be funny. Yes. If I got into Karras' body. Like, I, so he's, uh, so the Gemini killer is telling Kinderman, when like, I was electrocuted, thought it would be hilarious yeah. if I did this. When so. I was electrocuted and dying, there was the de- you know, the legion demon Pazuzu who's like, "I want you to switch bodies with this person that's dying over here because he's trying to exercise a d- the demon out of it." And so you're going to get in this body. And that's kind of crazy like that on that this other plane, there's like all these yeah, ins and outs going. Yeah, like, oh, come over here and get in. Body hopping. Yeah. Body hopping. Body hopping. It's a new all around. Body hopping it's a new in dance. the town. Body, Body hopping, hopping when you drop down dead. Body hopping <laughs> into Fred. Body hopping. <laughs> Woo! It's like a great like big band 40s swing yeah. band song. Um. Okay. So. This is when, though, Kinderman's like, you know what, honestly, I've heard enough, um, and he punches Brad Dourif, because it's, the transition has happened, so it's now Brad Dourif's character as something Vernon, what's his name, something Vernon is the Gemini killer, Yeah. Um, that's his name, but he punches him in the face, nose area, breaks his nose, and the nurse, like, comes in and is like, oh my god, like, screaming, <laughs> But then she, like, me, uh, has to take care of Kinderman's hand. She's, like, putting, like, you know, some Let's ointment on him and cleaning him up. And that's when she kind of, like, talks to him about the patient. And is like, yeah, that guy is fucking strange. <laughs> he passes out for, like, no damn reason. But his brain waves are going. But Nothing else he comes there. up, yeah, he comes off like he's completely dead. And he'll do this for, like, a while, for hours, and then he'll wake back up. And that's, I mean, she's telling us this as a way of saying, like, to the audience, I think. Hey, he's body leaving hopping. his body. <laughs> yeah. He body hopping. And so now, you know, as the audience, you're like, okay, his body hopping into what? Who's killing all the people? If he is locked in here, who's he hopping into? Spoiler alert, it's the old people. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's all the other catatonics that leave their brains unattended. Uh, and he's just like, yep, let me hop into the old people. Yeah, he says they're very easy to control. And he tells this to... Kinderman, Kinderman. yeah. Kinderman. And so we, you know, Kinderman's got a lot to think on. He's assaulted a patient in the hospital. So he, you know... <laughs> that's, I get reprimanded yeah, for that. Yeah, he's got that going for him. And he, he's got to reflect on some things because... 
I mean, sure, A and B equals C, but he's also, like, not, um, he's got a problem with not really believing in all of it, right? He's like, I don't know if I believe in a God that treats the world like, um, a toilet. And, but His then, word's not ours. <laughs> yeah. But then how, but then how does, how is all this crazy shit happening? And how does this man who's been locked in isolation know of all these murders that are taking place yeah. because the nurse the nurses said no he's barely cognizant or aware we're not going to be over there talking to him about the news of the day the, maybe the, he's body hopping to someone who's listening to the news well be, no because he's body hopping because <laughs> he's the one doing he's creating the news and that's another thing he has told Kinderman, it is me. I am the one doing these things, and I want you to tell the papers it's the Gemini killer doing this. I want to have... A warm day of glory. Yeah. He's having his I want, I need moment. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's his Disney princess like, moment. Recognize me. I'm He's like, Gemini. I'm the Gemini killer. I'm in your friend, Father Karras, but it's me. I'm the Gemini killer. I want you to go tell the papers that the Gemini oh killer is doing it. He would sing... Who is that girl I see staring straight back at me? Why That's am the Jim I song. murdering people? Oh, we're done? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so Kinderman's like, I don't really know what to believe, even though I do. I do. I should believe this. It's crazy to believe it. I should believe it, though. It's happening. Yeah. This is it's really all happening. happening. It's all happening. Is the next scene the, the nurse? Uh huh, yes. Uh, so the Gemini killer is like, you know what? I'll prove it. I'll prove it to you. And so he, this is the one, most wonderful scene, I argue, most wonderful scene of the whole movie is this suspense building scene, like this, sh this shot of just well, yeah, the it's hospital. Very masterfully done how he does it, you know, just holds on it and. You're just seeing this nurse walk around doing all her like little tasks, doing charts, putting things away, walking around. She and you're wondering why you're holding on this for a long time. And she goes into her room. And, and then, it's far away. Like she, the perspective of it is like at a down distance. The hallway. It's yes. A very like here's the mise en scène, and here's what's going on in the in the shot. And there's just like the comings and goings. There's even a couple other people that come into frame. There's a. Uh, a security guard. There's a another patient. And it's, it catches you off guard because of the banality of it, because of how mundane everything is. They're just doing their regular tests, and it goes on for like a good minute or two. And we get a fake like jump scare. Um, jump scare. And so that puts the audience back at ease. But we if you yeah, yeah, if you've listened closely enough to all the exposition that happens. The jump scare leads to the nurse telling the patient, her this patient that she I think actually, it's a doctor, or that doctor she, yeah, yeah, that she, she woke up accidentally, yeah. and he's like, you know, just trying to get a few hours of shut eye probably before his next shift, and he's like, what's your name? And she's like, Nurse Amy Keating, and you're like, dun, fuck, dun, dun. <laughs> like as you know, if you've been listening, if the name ends with K, he's gonna kill you. You're, it's a uh, some guy do with something. Gotta do something. Some, Some gotta do with something. something. And so we get, a, you know, okay, so we had our jump scare, we heard her name, and then it continues. We get a, a little bit more of that flow of just the. Get the back to another minute and a half of them just doing nothing, walking around. And then just right when you get like too comfy, a, Bam. Co a person in what looks like just basically like a hazmat kind of suit. Yeah, it almost looks very ghost like. Before I had watched the full movie and had seen that little clip, because I think it was kind of ruined for me in a way, but not ruined because it still made me jump when I saw yeah. it, you know. No, I, yeah, I watched it, I think, for the first time in, as a movie. I can't really remember. Sorry. It's been a while. It's been a while. I keep contradicting myself going back and forth. But, uh, well, but it's I remember also it really scared me when I did see it. On like, a lot of. Uh, top 10 or not even top 10 but like it's not it's on so many people's like scariest moments in horror like lists that Bravo yeah show. um and and then others like that and, and people just love this scene so it's by chance that you could have 
seen this yeah. just standing alone before seeing the movie, but I don't, yeah, I, th I agree with you in that, like, I don't think it would ruin it because you haven't, contextually, you haven't seen everything. Yeah, you're seeing everything. it out of context yeah. in, in that format, but... Oh my gosh, it's a good one. And we um, see the it's also weapon. also that music sting, too, get you. Yeah. It's so quiet, and then all of a sudden you... It's just a... An object, really something really creepy steps in the frame, and you get this loud music cue, and it just startles you. And it's these very sturdy, you know, medical... It's not even scissors. They're like what you would use to cut, like, bone and flesh from, you know, like, large cavities. Um, yeah. they're, they're, they are scissors in that they are styled that way. They the same cutting effect happens, but they are way more like industrial and them. yeah, it's like, so we find out that this is the weapon that's been used chop to the chop off. the heads off and it does it, how you see it. You're like, hell yeah, that would cut a head off in one clean yep. pop, man. Just <laughs> off it goes. Off of the head. And we don't see, again, we don't see the actual removal of the head or anything. We just see this cloaked figure in, like, white hazmat-ish looking suit come out with the scissor-like uh, hardware. And it's, like, walking towards. And come towards yeah. that nurse. But we know. What happened? Nurse dead. Nurse, like, hardcore dead. Nurse is dead, dead. And we cut right to them, like, talking about it. Like, it, it always kind of happens like that. The violence is typically off screen, but we get, like, a creepy build up to, like, some, like, flash or jump, and it cuts to them, like, at the crime scene. Yeah, like, all the cops are there at the crime scene, and we're still back at the hospital. And although I will say, probably in my list of favorite, like, movies and places where horror movies take place, a hospital is, like, not my most favorite. I kind of hate being set in hospitals yeah, for some reason. It's like... Maybe just because I don't like hospitals I was just going to say, I don't know if it's because of my own hospital anxiety and the idea that hospitals bring nothing but, like, just, like, sad. You know, like, people are there because they're hurt or because they Sick, need repair uh, or... Yeah, like, I don't know. I, they're just, like, not my favorite. And so I definitely know it's the fact that so much of the latter part of this movie takes place in the hospital as well. It gets me. Mm -hmm. So they're all there. They're still there. They're at the hospital, but the nurse screams down the hallway and is like calling Kinderman down to Dr. Temple's office. And we find that Dr. Temple has committed suicide. There's <laughs> the same like it's like a hypodermic needles there and what looks like the same kind of medication that the killer we know has been using to um yes to paralyze, paralyze the victims the victims before he plays with them and yeah tortures them. but dr temple just decided to overdose on it so he could you know asphyxiate and yeah. die really quickly probably getting scared of everything happening or do you think he was like made to do it well we'll are you is are you rhetorically asking that question? Okay, all right. Because I'm like, are you being silly right now? We do know the answer to that. <laughs> okay, um, so Kinderman goes back to the Gemini killer and is like, um, okay, so what the fuck's up? And uh, Brad Dourif, who's playing the Gemini killer in this moment, is like, oh, so I guess you got my calling card, right? Like, you got my love letter you found nurse Keating. I told you fucker. Like I told you it was me. I told you I do these things. Oh, and then did you also find Dr. Temple? Yeah. Cause that piece of shit, he committed suicide. I mean, I'm not going to say I didn't play with his brain a bit, but he committed suicide cause he couldn't hack it anymore. And, but he's also kind of killing off like any helpful witnesses that Kinderman could have to this case yeah. by, you know, knocking off Dr. Temple and we get another heavy monologue from Brad Dourif from Legion oh, further yeah just kind of pontificating on his all of his murders why he as one of many as Legion chose Karis because you know 
nothing it's it's just poetic that it would be a priest that would then commit all of these serial crimes and you know because the you're not going to be able to convince the world that he was possessed and so we're really just yeah. playing on a lot of levels of and it basically ends with him kind of giving a threat to Kinnerman and Kinnerman puts it together and is trying to race home because he realizes that he's going to do something to his family next. Yeah, like that I'm not done playing around with you with the, the game, the levels to my games are high stakes um, and I'm not done with you yet. You have, what does he say? You've about his daughter, a, you've right? made a clear indica- uh, invitation to the dance or whatever. Yes, that's what. And said. so, anyways, Kinderman is kind of spooked by some of the statements that he's made with that, and he leaves there knowing like there's something else that's about to happen. He calls his wife and is like, "There is a nurse coming." Well, he can't get through. We get a point of view of her at home, and we can tell she thinks, the wife thinks she's talking to her husband. She's like, oh, yeah. the nurse is on his way. Oh, guys, you're going to see, hear our oh. funny little ritual. Bye, Tennessee. It was great driving through you today. Bye, Tennessee. You. It was a lovely time, Hello, but we're Virginia. here in Virginia. Love you, girl. Keep us safe and sound. Virginia is for lovers, and we love you, girl. Um, and if that's the first time you've ever heard that, it's a treat, isn't it? Anytime we cross state lines, we always say, say goodbye to the state, goodbye and thank yous, <laughs> and hello, salutations, because yeah. we're in we're we're in a new state. We just like to you know say hellos and goodbyes. Okay, we're sentimental, giving out good energy, mm-hmm. so. always, um, because we do talk about spooky things in these yeah. states. So, <laughs> but it's all fun, and. So we're back to oh, okay, this high Ki- speed chase. Ki- yeah, Kinderman um, is calling. Uh, no, what we thought was he's calling uh, Father Morning. He's tr- he tries to put in a call to Father Morning, and Father Morning isn't there, and so but he's like trying to get Father Morning to she needs his help, and somebody at the hospital calls the wife at home and says there's a nurse on her way and she thinks that it's her husband her husband because she's all like okay hun see you later for dinner you know got or it but it's not it's not a nurse it's a catatonic like Old patient lady. that has kill or like yeah has taken the a nursing outfit and has taken the big scissor knife yeah. thing is and, this the lady that was crawling on the ceiling have we gone no, to that yet no okay. we well, that we were in that, like okay. that's where he was like going around trying to find the old lady, um, and he made a call to Father Morning okay. because he couldn't find her. And she's all crawling. And she's crawling the on top of the ceiling. Yeah, it's so yeah. Creepy. which in a way is like, okay, you know, jump to years later, and we've got like all of the movies of today where. I'm even thinking of like Hereditary where Ari Aster has like Tony Collette like crawling across the ceiling and so it's just like a fun that's a fun scary effect I love that um what's funny what's that one movie oh god it's a horror movie where there's it has that diner scene out in the desert and that old lady gets possessed and she's crawling around on the ceiling and going crazy mmm I know you know it we've seen it but it's just not coming to me what movie it is the diner scene and she Desert. It's She's like possessed. You guys out there, tell me yeah. what I'm talking about. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry we've digressed <laughs> again. Like, I'm talking about another, but yeah. Because Kinderman is like still at the hospital. He's trying to find the old lady because there are things that um, Jim, the Gemini killer, have said to him that it's gotten him all shaken up. He said, like, you've, you know, asked for um, an invitation with the dance. Um, how I move around here is through old people, mm-hmm. old friends, is what he says. So he goes over to the psychiatric area where the seniors are because he's wanting to find that old lady and yeah. thinks like, oh, that's what he means. He's using the old people. He says she's crawling around trying to get away from him. Like, he, but there is that cool shot where she's directly above him and yeah. like looks down and everything, and he can't see her. But um, so there's also another nurse that's headed to. Kinderman's house 
with the scissor things. And he's also now heading to his house because he knows someone's heading to his house. It's almost like he's like, you know what, Friedkin had a famous car chase in the French Connection. Yeah. I'm going to do one now and have my Friedkin moment. <laughs> That's true. Because it is like all this weird high-speed chase down Georgetown. And or, George it's a little C. Clunk, Scott is like, ah! Yeah. <laughs> he's always like squawking in this movie. He's so funny. But I love it. So Kinderman does end up showing up to his house and he's got like some muscle behind him. You know, he's got other police cars there with him and his wife is like what is up with this nurse she showed up she passed out the nurse is like sitting close at the table at the like lunch on breakfast table or whatever and the daughter is sitting there and then all of a sudden the nurse is like speaking but it's Brad Dourif's voice coming yeah. out and he's all like ha, I wanted you to be here for this and if it wasn't for the grandma the one that like has the fish in the bathtub and everything. Being kind of low key racist, calling her daughter, her granddaughter's hair Pocahontas, and getting weirded out, saying something about saying something Jewish, like Jewish people. people. Yeah, like but she saves the granddaughter at the at the breakfast table yes. by pulling her by her hair. And you get this funny like rubberneck situation too. Yeah, like, it's a little like. Cl too close almost like because the the, the yeah, scissor like, thing completely opens uh -huh. and then kind of closes a little yeah. like but you do have that like uh, visceral like <laughs> oh my god like her neck was nearly just like fucking cut off in front of her whole family yeah. um poor but, girl but grandma saves the day and then everybody gets to witness like this possession that happens where bodies are getting thrown around the kitchen and Kinderman's getting thrown around his own kitchen. <laughs> yeah, he's <sighs> taking a beating in this movie. It's exhaustive. This whole, like, it's like one after another and then we go here and then we go there and now Kinderman's racing back to the hospital so he can get back to... Father Morning. Yeah. Fa okay, so he's racing back to the hospital and we get a scene where Father Morning shows up and the Hospital, fake the, the, the fake nurse at the house like she starts screaming and morning. like yeah she's like morning and we have father morning showing up at the hospital and the gemini killer's like Wah! she's not happy about it so now we're back at the hospital with the gemini killer and father morning mm -hmm. that's where we are and father morning comes in you know starts saying all of like the Catholic stuff. The exorcism rites. The exorcism yes. rites. Gosh. I just handed this last scene over to you. Well, I'm driving. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they're going through it together. and <laughs> they are going There's a possessed person and then a priest, and they're going through they're it going together. They're going through it together. But he's really, like, working Father Morning over. He's got him up on the ceiling. But Father His Morning's, like, trying... Flash is, like... Attaching to the Adhered ceiling. Adhered to it. It's crazy. So when he pulls away, it's like pulling his scalp. All his epidermis is coming off. Oh, it's so gross. It is nasty. It's gnarly. And so he dies. No, he doesn't die. <laughs> Father Morning doesn't die? Not yet. Okay. Golly. I mean, but he does. Well, but not yet because he helps save the day. Oh, um, that's right. So, okay. But just to mention that, like, we finally get an exorcism. That's 13 right. minutes until like it's the end of the movie's happening in 13 minutes and we get our exorcism yeah. scene and it's heavy it's like walls are shaking the production level is heavy here there's people coming out from underneath the tile floorboards from <laughs> hell itself we've got legion screaming and transferring in and out of being jason miller or brad dura snakes yeah, like we even have actual like animal life. Yeah, like a cobra. I swear Serpents I saw a cobra. Serpents are there. There's multiple snakes. It's Snakesville. <laughs> and Father Morning is passed out, being kind of like pulled into the nether regions of hell. And Kinderman is there now. And he almost shoots um, Father Kara slash Legion slash. He gets slash, thrown to the wall. Yeah, and he's got like 
Legion asking him, like, well, do you believe me now? And then we get Kinderman with a another monologue. Well, he gets his own monologue about everything he believes in and how it's all like, I believe in all the terrible things and, like, sin yeah. and depravity and adultery. adultery. And <laughs> I believe in... Murder. I, w- I, w- I would want to believe in, like, tits on air. <laughs> like, crazy. <laughs> the, it's... So long winded. Yeah, it's just, the monologues. It's very monologue heavy. Exorcist it's exhaustive. Three. It's like Exorcist One didn't have that many monologues. <laughs> and you know what Exorcist One had that this one doesn't is like we got some crucifixion, masturbation. Yeah, we got that. And we did not get that that in Exorcist Three. Yeah, we needed. We, Father Dyer, like, masturbating with a crucifix, right? We should have. We should have gotten, like, anal, like, crucifix. We should have gotten beads coming out of, like... The rosary beads? Yes. Like, it should have been rosary beads coming out of an anus. Oh, my like, gosh. That's just... I... Blasphemous. Well, I'm Catholic, so I can say these things. Oh, and sure. that's fine, right? <laughs> like... I'm allowed. That's how we're getting around this. That's is between I'm you and your God. That's between me and my many gods. So now it's this like show off where Kinderman's like, yeah, I believe in like everything now. Thank you. And then he shoots Legion. And because Karis like came out for like a moment. It was like, do it, do it now. Do it now. Do it now. Shoot me. And Father Morning does this like exorcism right right when he needs to he just is like no be the, thy servant no more and Karis is like do it do it now Kinderman <laughs> and Kinderman shoots him and then shoots him in the brain and it's over and then we get like oh, we get the little boy singing oh, again oh, <laughs> yeah er- earlier Brad Dourif was singing that in the hospital and it just it was Imagine so yeah doesn't. no and let well, you know what we'll save that we can get into that in a follow up we'll get because yep. we are done this movie is done We're credits gonna... roll <laughs> and how do you feel about it yeah, <laughs> yeah. we'll get into it We're, we'll get into how we feel about it in part two after we go have fun in Georgetown so we're going to go see all the sites get to visit some locations and the steps we'll see the house just cause you gotta see it but we'll see you know the some of the churches yeah. rowing area we'll just see what we see and we'll come back and we're gonna tell you all about it in the second part of our show guys so stay tuned we'll be right back take care listen to some bad athlete we'll be right back We've already gone on the vacay, guys. Part we're two. Back. No, we're, yeah, delirious because we just actually drew, uh, drove over the Oklahoma State line, so we are back in Oklahoma. We still yeah. have a couple hours, few hours. Last heard us go into Virginia. We wanted to spare you our cringy, you know, little tradition of entering a new state, so we wait until we got back. But we're on Interstate 44, south, west, whatever this, it goes. We're, we'll hit Tulsa soon. And yes. then we'll be back in Oklahoma City in a few hours. But we've been driving all day. Oh my gosh, it's been a whirlwind. We stopped off in Louisville and Kentucky had a good overnight fun, had some eats, and then. Yeah, but. Bed. Last you heard, we were on our way to Georgetown and we actually had the best Georgetown day. We want to tell oh, you so all fun. about it. 
Um, we kind of marked everything off our checklist that we wanted to do, starting with finding great parking right outside of uh, Call Your Mother. Yes. The Call Your Mother, a, a Jewish, Jewish, de Jewish deli. deli. Super cute, yummy bagel. We split uh, everything bagel with like, you know, the, Salmon, the capers, tradition yeah. lox and yeah. schmear of it was cream so cheese. Good. And, uh -huh. Had some oh, cold God. brew. And it was delicious. The TikTok hype did not disappoint. Yeah, no, it, it it's great. Please go if you're in the Georgetown, D.C. area. They have a few in the area. So visit a location. Get a bagel. And the Georgetown one was really nice. We went inside. We right away got service. We got there about 10 30. Um, there was, you could sit inside and eat, but it would be a little awkward. It's a small space. But there's like, you know, a few little picnic benches outside, little concrete benches you can sit on. They do not want you sitting on the stoops of the neighbors. There's even signs saying, like, do not sit here. Yeah. Um, like, someone lives here, don't sit on their stoop, please. But yeah, go get yourself a bagel. It was divinity in a uh, boiled piece of bread. Oh my gosh, you know, well, I've heard, and this may be a rumor I don't, I mean, I haven't looked it up to verify it, but I believe there is five pieces of bread is the equivalency of a bagel. Yeah, sign five me Five slices up. of bread. Sign so me up. So it is dense, just... Yummy carbs. However, these you could tell were scooped, you know, and then how they like would assemble it and then cut it, and you could like open it up, and it just looked amazing, tasted amazing. So yeah, that we started the day off perfectly. Yes. Uh, call your mother, and then we were like, let's go do a exorcist locale. So we yes. went to uh, the most iconic one. The stairs, the house. Yes, we went and walked Prospect Street and walked up and down the stairs and saw the that. owners of the Exorcist house turned the sprinklers on us. We weren't even trying to like look in their backyard, but we were kind of standing there on our phones, trying to get our phones ready for pictures and selfies. And all of a sudden, the sprinklers turn on, and you can see someone in the backyard controlling it. We're like, oh my god! It was weird because like we're not, we weren't on their property. There's a wall, like so they just saw like the tops of our heads and thought they're up to no good. Those kids. Yeah, we were like in this little alley that you go in on the side of the house where they would have built really the extension in the movie of the house, so he could have fallen out the window and gone right down the steps. Because in reality, the house. The window is not that close to the steps. He would have had to, like, really flew out yeah. the window. There's, like, a few hundred feet he would have had to have gone. So, yeah, um, we walked up and down those steps. There's, It's funny, on the top and bottom of the stairs, someone has put some Pazuzu stickers. and So we got some fun pictures of that. You know, pictures of, like, there's a plaque down there. Kind of yes. the stuff we did the first time. That whole area, yeah, is, like, kind of well-documented with little film... Um, plaques that kind of like describe the the movie and why it's iconic. Yeah, there's one up on the top of the stairs that says like Hollywood in DC. <laughs> <laughs> kind of explains Hollywood the in movie. DC, so ritzy. Yes. Um, and then we walked over to Georgetown University and walked the grounds. Got some really um, nice pictures. The location, everything is just so picturesque. It it's that is gorgeous. Kind of collegiate town vibe. It looks very British almost. Like what you would think like Oxford or yeah. something would look like. You imagine there's going to be like some polo and lacrosse players. And you see it like coming into the city. You cross this bridge. I don't want to say the wrong name but you cross a bridge to come into Georgetown and you just see like the school beaming on this hill and the huge clock tower and it was nice. We sat in the shade and these like lawn chairs they had like in their quad or whatever and just Chilled, played on our phone, took pictures, edited pictures. <laughs> it, it was Got nice. a little it was bit so of peaceful. a break from the hot heat because it, it was hot. That was, was kind the of 90s. the main motivation. It was like soak up the camp, the, the campus, and like get out of the heat. For yes. Minute. So we just relaxed in in some like Adirondack. Is chairs, that what they call yeah. it? Yeah, Adirondack chairs, the mountains. Yeah, whatever. And then after we had um, just had a little bit of a respite. We were like, you know what? Let's go to the tombs. That's where the scene was shot of Kinderman and Dyer grabbing a bite to eat and them just kind of expanding on, oh, just their melancholia around the date and how they feel about religion. 
And when you get there, it's really fun. Like, you go down these, like, spooky stairs, that, like, right off the street. Yeah, it's, like, in the basement. And you really feel like you're under. You can see why it's called the tombs. And it all has that collegiate rowing vibe to it. Yeah. There's oars everywhere, which go with the whole theming of Exorcist 3. There's a lot of talk of rowing and, you know, that one kid getting put up on a cross of oars. Uh-huh. So. And the whole opening scene where the guys are rowing on the water. Mm-hmm. It's just like, yes, that is so much a part of Georgetown. Yeah. The rowing scene. <laughs> yeah. So we ordered a pitcher of beer and ordered these crab fries that were oh, so good. divine. If you know Old Bay Spice, that's what these were. They were just like smothered and baked they in Old Bay in Spice. It, it was wonderful. It was one of the best things. I love crab. I love Old Bay Spice. So it, And I love French fries. Especially when you're in that part of the country, like D.C., Maryland. Like, it's all about the crab and the crab spice and the Old Bay Spice. Crab in your mouth. So I try to eat as much of that kind of stuff as possible when, you know, I'm like in D.C. or Baltimore, or Virginia, that whole area. Eat that whole crab. areola. Eat your crabs. It was kind of after that, we had to like move the car, um, which is a funny story in itself. We talked about the parking and getting some great parking, and we didn't want to give it up, but it was two hour parking, so we kind of had to. And this advice is really maybe just for the summer because I can't guarantee what it's like in the fall, but in the summer with a lot of the students gone, we were able to find free parking on the street, but you got to remember it's only two hour parking. So we had parked for the bagel shop. And then, you know, A, walked around, did all that kind of stuff, went back. Luckily, there was an empty spot, just literally, it was a one-way street that we had parked. So just right across from where we had parked, there was another empty spot. So I pulled out, backed up into the one across the street, and we were parked there for another two hours. It was perfect. It was perfect timing. We had to go literally nowhere, maybe like 50 feet. Yeah, it it was was really fun. So we still had some free parking, which meant we could obviously be there longer because we had our liner plans at Martin's Tavern, an iconic just tavern that goes back, you know, for lots of years. That pub's been there for a long, 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 long time. John and Jackie used to eat there. There's like pictures of them. Uh, there's also like plaques of all the different like politicians and famous people that have eaten in there and like it'll be like the Madeleine Albright booth or yeah. there's like something about John C. Riley eating there all the time like it's some little blurb in a paper that's on the wall like but it's very like you know has that like east coast very DC almost New England vibe but you know DC is not quite New England but just something about DC uh, Georgetown in general is just so quaint. It's all like these cobblestone streets and cute little row houses everywhere. It's very picturesque. It still reminds me of... It, I want to be there at Halloween time. I Walking around the streets, I hear that tubular bells and yeah. think of that Halloween scene a lot when we were walking around. I love that, too, because you can see the leaves and you just mm-hmm. ugh, all the clothes they're wearing. But that's the original. We're not talking about that. Oh, Oh, God. (laughs) Okay. So, we'll get into it. Um, So, yeah, Martin's Tavern was great. They gave Justine a free piece of cake because it was her birthday. Because it was my birthday. It was actually the day after her birthday, but... But when I set up the reservation, I had said we were celebrating something, so we got a cake. Yeah, it was really fun. And they asked her, they're like, do you want the whole, like, hullabaloo, like, us coming out and singing, or do you just want the cake? (laughs) And I was like, uh, I want just the cake. (laughs) <laughs> no hullabaloo for me, thank you. But what did we have there? We had great food there, too. I think I had crab cakes again. Chicken skewers. Yeah, that's right. You had chicken skewers. I had a crab cake and some fries. Like, again, eat as much crab as I can. All right. Crab flavored thing. Should we move into our fave scenes, get into the movie? No, because we even talk about walking down to the water. Oh, yeah, I guess we did walk to the we waterfront. We did like, some other stuff. Yeah, we walked down to the waterfront, and that's really pretty. You get a gorgeous view of, like, the Kennedy Center, and there's, like, a lot of shopping on Wisconsin Street that goes down to M Street, and we walked by a lot of shops, but we didn't really go in anywhere. Georgetown is a town of money, so it's a lot of, like, high-end shops, and, you know, we're walking around, like, the 90-degree heat, you know, maybe on another day, if I didn't feel, like, sweating gross, I would have gone into, you know, the Rolex shop and looked around to yeah. the case. Not Ralph that I could, Lauren. Yeah, just, but, it just wasn't the day, but we had a great day in Georgetown. Georgetown's a, 
you go on the, in the summer on a weekday, you might find some good parking, some good walking, eat street shops, go see the exorcist sites. It's really fun to go see the steps. They're, Cute little day trip. Especially for you horror fan listeners, it's iconic. It feels like hallowed ground almost. <laughs> yeah, when you're there, you feel one with all of the horror community. And you know, both Exorcist 1 and Exorcist 3 both have so many shots just of Georgetown and like the camera looming, especially in 3 of the camera just going through the streets of Georgetown. And it's, you know, it's fun just to be like, oh, I think this is where the camera was coming down the street at night in the beginning scene and trying to spot all the locations you've seen in the movie. And, and you do feel very submerged in the movie almost when you're walking those streets because it is very well represented. It's yeah, they're, authentic. They're proud of it. You know, it probably does bring in a certain amount of tourism for them. Yeah, I mean, it's D.C. hosts wa Hollywood or whatever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Even though the guy, our waiter in the tombs, had like no idea oh about the exorcism. Oh my god. Theory, we I asked felt kind of old asking him. Like, and he was probably in his 20s. He was like, huh? We're like, oh, they filmed scenes from The Exorcist 3 in here. I was wondering if you knew, like, which where... Which pub, you know, like, which, uh, where they sat. Where they sat. Are there any pictures of the filming anywhere down here? He's like, no. Like, it just seemed so weirded out by it. I was like, okay, cool. Like, I cannot believe these people are like still continuing to talk to me. Yeah, I felt like I had to explain ourselves. I was like, well, we're a horror movie podcast and this is a filming location for Exorcist 3. And we're just like, yeah, know? like, never mind, you don't care. Never All mind. right, you'll pull down our underwear. Bye. <laughs> so um, that was funny. Yeah, that was the only awkward thing. Yeah, they don't know anything about the Exorcist 3 filming in tombs. If yes. You know there. But you should go to the tombs because it's fun and they have good fries and beer. It's very like old school yeah, pub. You know, pub. there's nothing hipster or you know, reaching about the place. It's just is what it is. You can tell that place hasn't changed in years. It's like an old school stable. Probably tons of students and professors and staff and faculty alike go you know, down there frequent that drinks. place during yeah. the regular school year. All right. Yeah, it was a nice easy day. Just a bit hot. Yeah, that was the only complaint, but, you know, we don't, can't control the sun, and neither can you, but we, I, it's almost like if I'm prepared to sweat, and I know it's going to happen, I'm more okay with it. Yeah. It's like, when I don't dress for it, and, When you're you uncomfortable know, and stinky. Yeah. But yes. I was just kind of going with it, like, okay, we're going to be gross. This is what we're doing. And we so. dipped into different coffee shops, and we'll cool off, and sit in the car for a few minutes when we have to repark. <laughs> so. Yeah, because we visited um, a I mean, we got a couple of cold brews. Um, DC, you've got good coffee, so, or, yeah. you know, Georgetown, you've got good coffee, so it's always wonderful to try new places when you're there. So if you do go on a hot day, there's plenty of ways to cool off. Go into the shops, go into the coffee shops, you know, there's a lot of places to dine. Yeah. There's a lot of ways to cool off there. Go sit Let in some shade see. in the park. And let, you know, us and things like Instagram and TikTok give you inspiration on where to go. Yeah, go hang out find. Georgetown. Um, it, it was a lot of fun. It was surprising how much I enjoyed it. Yeah, and time just kind of passed us by. It was like blink and it was 3 o'clock. We were, yeah. had been there since the morning. So there's just a lot to do and a lot to see. It's very, very picturesque and all the homes. So you could just kind of like get... Not lost, but just linger in those neighborhoods looking at all the homes. Yeah, and, if you're wanting more a more authentic D.C. experience, you know, it's not on the mall. You're, it's not just the monuments and the museums. If you want to, like, experience a neighborhood and, you know, good dining and stuff, go on over to Georgetown. Hop on over. Hop on over. All right, well, let's hop back into the movie, cover our favorite scenes, and give our knives ratings. I... I don't know. I think it's maybe it's silly. I mean, I know my fave scene. I think it's. I know which one you're gonna pick, so I'll go with my like second favorite, really, which is the scene in close to the beginning where the priest gets murdered in the booth. Yeah. In the confessional booth. There's something about that. It's so creepy. I think it's the first time in the movie that you hear the voice of the old person talking of the murderer. Um, just something about it, how it builds up from this confession into like, oh, this is getting creepier and creepier. Where she's and, like, I'm going, you know, like, all the blood. And yeah, and you can tell, I wonder if he's already been affected by the poison somehow. 
Because he's just sitting there, like, breathing heavy, getting really freaked out himself before it cuts to that scream. And I like how he builds up the tensions and does those crazy cuts to, like, people reacting to the violence and stuff. Yeah, we don't really get necessarily all the gore. We get a lot of description of gore. Mm -hmm. You can tell, like, William Peter Blatty is a talented filmmaker. He just, you know, they're... I know there's a lot of interference with the studio and there's a lot of things that do hit really well in this movie and there's some things that don't. Uh, It's a valiant effort, The Exorcist 3. Yes. (laughs) Okay, so I guess uh, mine is just kind of the, not just the iconic, but it is the iconic like scare of the movie. I love the tension building. That scene itself is just shot so wonderfully and it seemed, it's, there's not too many cuts, so you just yeah. kind of get to, your eye gets to wander on the screen while the it, nurse is walking around doing what seems like just mundane things, mm-hmm. but you can, that tension, you can feel it, it's going to happen. You just don't know when. And you get two good jump scares in that scene, too, but building up really to the death of the nurse. Yeah. But nurse yeah, Key. it's iconic, and it's really well executed. One of the best jump scares. And again, you're not seeing the gore gore Yeah, part. you're seeing him come out with the... Uh, well, and you can't even really tell what it is. Like, I used to always think it was kind of like a ghost or something. Like, before you... You know, when you just see the clip, you're like, what the hell is that? Right. But, the big, huge scissor thing. Yeah. Oh, your car is talking... Your car is so magical, and it talks to you whenever somebody is driving close by. Mm-hmm. It talks to you. That was Gail telling me, watch out. Somebody was driving by, so Gail let us know we didn't need to get over at the same time. Thank you, Gail. She's so kind. She's great. Okay, knives ratings. I I'm gonna go. I'll I'll go, and I'm gonna give it a really uh, solid three and a half. Okay, that's good. Good for you. Three and a half knives, and again, like you said, it's a valiant effort. I, I, I enjoy it. I, I want to now watch the ninth configuration because I have enjoyed watching Blatty behind mm-hmm. the camera. I know how he writes. I've read The Exorcist and we've seen, you know, the adaptation of it being on the screen. So I see that. I know he can tell a story, but yep. it, he can actually, he can paint a good picture too. Yeah, we got to watch the ninth configuration, y'all. But, yeah, I'll go solid three knives out of five. I I like it a lot. Um, just compared to the original, you know, it's just, you know, m- most horror movies do kind of in some ways compare to the original. Because the original not only is just a great horror movie, but just a great movie. It's so well done, acted, directed, written, you know. It, yeah. You know, it's a classic. But this one is a really great follow-up. You know, ignores these the second movie pretty much. And... Yeah. It just does its own thing. And that's okay with me. I don't mm-hmm. necessarily think that the sequels that you make have to be an immediate follow-up. Um, and sometimes it's good to digress and to go somewhere yeah. else in the story. Especially when it is years later and you're not going to have, like, Reagan as a character again. You know, things yeah. like that. It's like, just move on. Move <laughs> on with your life, exorcist. But you can tell in it where the heavy handedness was taking place with the production yeah. and that um, the story there's little gaps where maybe because of what Blatty wanted to do versus what producers wanted to do it, it just shows on the screen there's a little emptiness yeah just like throwaway things where they're mentioning father what's his name that shows up at the very end oh father morning it's father like morning. we they, give him a sprinkle yeah they make sure to throw in a blurb they probably shot it reshot a scene yeah. to throw in his name so when he comes out of nowhere at the end it's like well remember they did mention him yeah and because but. they had to go with um, it being a sequel and wanting it to be The Exorcist 3, they had to have an exorcism. And there are references to the first movie, but that doesn't bother me at all. It's like, of course, but it's something about just like the throw in of the father mourning. And even though I like the special effects of like his head getting ripped off or his skin getting stuck to the ceiling. And it's head ripping getting off. ripped off. It's like the skin yeah, and the it, scalp. His basically. skin adheres to the ceiling and then, yeah, gravity. It's good that it, it, it's got a lot going for it. It really does. And maybe if it had it's had a little bit more time or... Yeah, it's enjoyable to watch. I like how it's kind of a procedural. And 
but George C. Scott is just crazy enough. Like his performance is so committed. <laughs> yeah, you can tell that like he is very much playing this role of this sad detective who, who's traumatized and scarred from something that happened long ago, but it's never really been resolved. And he's gruff as hell. And he doesn't really enjoy people. No. All of his interactions, he's just a li- it's a little on the harsh side. You can just tell that the, the force and all of the hardness of what's probably transpired in all of his years on the force, he's like, I don't really like people too much. They he's nice to me. his family. He seems sweet to his family, though. <laughs> yes. So he's a well-rounded character. I will uh, definitely <laughs> say that the half knife goes to the rubber neck. Oh, yes. Uh, that the alone. the getting pulled by grandma. <laughs> yes. Pulled that, away from the scissors. That right there. That's why you get a half a knife is <laughs> that effect right there. It's Fair just enough. golden. Yeah. All right. But yeah, overall, I enjoy The Exorcist 3. It's rewatchable for me. Yeah, give it a watch. Give the director's uh, cut a watch as well. You know, they're, it's not, they're, they're both good. They're both worth a watch. Watch the commentary. There's a great Scream Factory available if you can find it. And I think it's available like on Shudder and on Amazon. It's easy to find yeah. on the apps, y'all. Just Speak to Alexa and tell Alexa what you want. Say, show me Exorcist 3. And then she'll say, I'm sorry, did you want chicken sous vide? <laughs> You're like, yeah. <laughs> what? That sounds good, too. Okay. Um, well, next up for us was something else that we did on this trip, this magnificent trip. Yeah, episode um, 91. You're getting... Hershey Park and Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Whoop, whoop. Going back to some kinder whore that uh, if you were a child of a certain age during kind of like the 70s late 70s and the... all the way up till when yeah. I was a youngin. Yeah. And probably till now. This is still a classic. A lot yeah. of people still watch this movie. and It's fun and terrifying. So come, let's listen up for that next month. Yes. And until then, take care. Give us a like, a, a follow. Give us a review. Five stars. It really helps us out. Please, go do it. We appreciate it. <laughs> and right. we will see you next month. Bye. Take care. Bye.